Welcome to today's webinar, Cultural Orientation for Afghan Arrivals. My name is Jamie Bussey, and I am one of the facilitators today. I am the Deputy Director for the Cultural Orientation Resource Exchange, and I am joined by my colleagues, Ella Fowler, who's our Research and Learning Officer, and Manar Maruf, who is our Senior Training Coordinator. Collectively, we have more than 25 years of experience in resettlement, technical assistance, and cultural orientation delivery. As we start today's webinar, we want to inform you of a few important parts of what we'll be doing today. First, uh, we will be recording today's session. Uh, we also have enabled the live transcript. Uh, you will be able to find this at the top or the bottom of your screen, and you can enable this. As a note, the live transcript is not 100% accurate. It sometimes mixes up words that might sound similar to one another. In addition to recording the webinar and the live transcript, we will be sharing the recording and all the resources that we provide today after the session. Uh, take it, it takes us about 24 to 48 hours to get that out to everybody who's registered. So if you have staff who um, registered but are not able to be here, they will receive that email. And we also will make the webinar uh, widely available um, for everybody, even if they didn't register. Finally, if you, I see a lot of familiar names, uh, so welcome to those who are familiar with CORE's webinars, but if you are new, uh, our motto here is that your participation matters. Um, and on that note, we are gonna review some of the Zoom features we're going to use today. The first feature that we're gonna use uh, is the raise your hand feature. Um, you'll be, be able to find this at on your menu at the bottom or the top of your screen, depends on where your menu is located on your computer. Um, to test this, um, so you'll see the icon and we wanna test it. So I'd like to see a show of hands. Uh, I see a couple of people have already raised their hands. I would love you to raise your hand if you have been deployed to one of the safe havens or military bases. So if you have been deployed to one of the bases, um, that is accepting Afghan arrivals. We'd love to see um, if you uh, have a tent, have you been there? Um, and I see some people have raised their hands who have been, so that's great. Um, I'd love to also go ahead and raise your hand if you have started receiving Afghan arrivals at your local resettlement agency. Oh, good. I see some of the hands are going up. So yes, quite a few have already started receiving Afghan arrivals um, that you know, are specific to those that have been evacuated uh, starting in August. Great, great. So we're going to use the uh, hand raising feature a little bit more uh, later on. The second feature we're going to use in today's webinar, which you guys are very familiar with, I see already is the chat function. Uh, so I can see a lot of you have already used the chat function. So we do have uh, at this time, we almost have 400 people on this call. Um, so that chat function is going to be quite lively, which is great. If you are not if you've not used that before, you can find that on the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'd like to have you practice. So, oh great, Lillian's using the emoticons. So I'd love for you to answer in the chat how long you've worked in refugee resettlement. So how many of you, how long in the chat feature have you been in resettlement? So you could put six months, two years, three years. Oh great, I see some nine years, one month, seven years. Wow, there's a lot of variety, nine months, three months. I think I saw a couple of weeks on there. They're really great, 22 years. Wow, wow, excellent, so great. So I see we all are using the chat feature quite well. The last two features that we're going to be using today are the question and answer and uh, polls. For the question and answer, uh, please note, we're gonna do our best to answer as many questions as possible during the webinar, but if we do only have an hour. So any questions we're not able to answer, we will uh, provide those answers after the webinar. The other thing that we've done with the Q&A is that when you put a question in the Q&A, you can, other people can upvote. So what does this mean? This means that if you see a question that you also want answered, you can hit like, and that helps us to prioritize which questions are most important to you. And again, we also use the poll feature. Um, when that happens, you'll see the poll pop on your screen and you'll be able to respond to the question. With that, let's get started. So by the end of today's webinar, we hope you will be able to 
explain how Afghan evacuation is impacting the delivery of key CO messages across the CO continuum. Identify differences and similarities in providing CO to Afghan arrivals with attention to APA requirements. APA is Afghan Placement and Assistance Program. We also want you to be able to find and use core resources to address needs of Afghan arrivals for effective cultural orientation delivery. And we want you to mobilize to provide cultural orientation as a critical service for arrivals and know how to stay up to date on changes. We divided this webinar into three sections. We're gonna start with learning about cultural orientation messaging that's happening before uh, Afghans arrive to local resettlement agencies. We're going to unpack the APA requirements, and then we're going to look at tips and resources to be successful in delivering cultural orientation to Afghans. I want to start by acknowledging that the current events with Afghan arrivals and Operation Allies Welcome is unprecedented during most of our lifetimes. I also want to highlight that in this space, um, as you could see in the chat, we're bringing a lot of levels of experience. I think someone said they've been here for just a little over a week or under a week, and we have people with 24 years of experience. I think that this is going to be important. I also wanna highlight it's important to recognize all of our limitations, regardless of experience, and also the ability to rely on one another and those at your organization and your community. Uh, this is a evolving situation, um, you know, the APA requirements, which we'll talk about later. Uh, a lot of those have been coming out in the last weeks. Uh, we also just got new guidance today about walk-ins. And so it's really important that we remain patient and flexible. And with that, I'd like to actually briefly review what is happening with cultural orientation at the military bases or safe havens. And to do this, we're gonna play a game of true or false using the hand racing feature. So let me get my, my participant pane open so I can see how you guys are answering. So on the screen, I will provide a statement and I want you to raise your hand if it is true. If you are unable to find the hand raising feature, you can also put your answer in the chat. So the first statement we have is in the past, Special immigrant visa holders from Afghanistan received formal pre-departure cultural orientation. Raise your hand if you think this is true. And again, I see so far we have 80 people who have raised their hand that this is true. We have over 100. I'll give you guys five more seconds. Again, if you think it's true, raise your hand. All right, so the answer is actually false. In the past, special immigrant visa holders processed through the Afghan um, embassy did not receive a formal pre-departure cultural orientation. This is different than the majority of other refugees that are processed through resettlement support centers. If you are new to resettlement, which I see there's many of you who are new to resettlement and you're unfamiliar with pre-departure cultural orientation, we recommend that you check out the About Cultural Orientation page on our website and Ella's gonna put that link in the chat. We're not gonna spend time today talking about pre-departure cultural orientation in regards to the resettlement support centers, but it's really important to understand that usually refugees receive pre-departure cultural orientation. However, historically in the past, special immigrant visa holders did not. They did receive emails with information about life in the United States and what to expect. Um, but you can imagine when you're packing and preparing to leave, there's a lot of information. And so you might, might not have read that email, right? Um, we also bring this up because if you have worked with special immigrant visa holders in the past, you may have experienced the need to manage expectations and also misinformation that might have been slightly different than some of the other uh, populations that you serve. All right, so let's do another true or false. So let's go ahead and lower your hands. I'm going to lower everybody's hands so we can have a fresh start here. Okay, perfect. So the next statement we have, and again, you're going to raise your hand if this is true, is that before leaving bases, all Afghans will receive cultural orientation. Again, raise your hand if you think this is true. And I'll give you about 15, 20 seconds to do that. 
And again, if you can't find the, the raise your hand feature, you can also put your answer in the chat as well. And when you use the chat feature, I forgot to highlight, make sure that you select to everyone. So when that opens, if you're using that, make sure you select everyone so everyone can see your response. All right, so we, we have a lower number of individuals who think this is true. So let's find out. This is also false. It's important to understand, as I mentioned earlier, that this is really an evolving situation. And this is not a, a usual scenario to have this large of number of individuals um, going through processing here in the United States. Um, and so there's a lot of factors that might influence if and what kind of cultural orientation messages individuals are receiving prior to them arriving at your resettlement agency. So some of those factors include bases have a lot of immediate needs to address. Um, those of you who've been deployed at the bases probably have a good sense of what those immediate needs are. The other thing that may affect what and if they receive cultural orientation is the length of stay at the base or if they decide to leave the base on their own, uh, which is happening. However, that being said, there are um, a number of actors. This is an interagency response. There's a lot of individuals involved with um, the military bases and the safe havens. Um, sorry, I'm using military base and safe havens interchangeably. They're the same same kind of terms. Um, so, you know, there are DHS is the lead. Um, we also have PRM who's involved. And we at CORE are also working with the bases to try to provide technical assistance um, around cultural orientation, particularly around topics about the role of resettlement agency, employment, limits of benefits, cost of living, U.S. laws and cultural adjustments. Um, so we also are working with some of the staff, um, USCCB, in coordinating that effort. But it's a lot of work and there's a lot of individuals um, involved and there's a lot of movement of staff in and out of the bases. So we hope to continue to provide CO messaging and we hope it will improve, but we just want to manage expectations that at this present time, some of the messaging um, is happening, some of it's being implemented, some of it's already been implemented, but it varies really uh, based on the safe haven location. All right, the next, uh, so let's go ahead and lower your hands. And again, you can put questions in the Q&A as you have them, and uh, we'll answer those um, as we can, um, and also we have some time at the end. All right, so the last statement that I have for you is that people who receive cultural orientation need to hear key messages more than once. Let's go ahead and raise your hand if you think this is true, that people who receive cultural orientation need to hear key messages more than once. Great. And we have over 500 people on here, so I hope everybody's being active and listening. And we have a 272 people have raised their hand that people who receive cultural orientation need to hear key messages more than once. All right, so we'll wait for a few more people to put their, raise their hand if they think it's true. All right, so let's see. So this is true. It's important to remember that even those that do receive cultural orientation messaging are contending with A, cognitive load, B, trauma, both of which can affect the information they receive. In addition to this, we should also anticipate the usual trend of misinformation, which can result from misinterpreting information shared, remembering only parts of being, um, only parts of what's shared, or perhaps, you know, variable information being shared from friends and family. We do know that we've had a lot of SIV holders and Afghans resettled to the United States and each person has their own unique experience that they share. So this is why both staff training and coordination with the community will be critical to deliver cultural orientation messages along with establishing trust. Um, so it's really important to know that even if someone does receive cultural orientation at the bases, they might only remember certain pieces of that because they're also contending with a lot of information um, and their other needs that they might be more pressing for them. Okay, so based on this information, I'd like us to go to the chat and I'd like you to answer the following question. What qualities will be important for you to have when providing cultural orientation to Afghan arrivals? So thinking about the information that I've shared so far, 
what qualities do you think will be important for you um, to have when delivering cultural orientation? So I see patience, kindness, language capacity, uh, open-mindedness, empathy, culturally aware, humility, ability to listen, great, correct interpretation, definitely. So especially when you're talking about messaging, language skills, clarity, um, really, really wonderful trauma, trauma-informed, and we do have some links around that as well. Um, understanding some of the Afghan cultural practices, cultural humility, rules and regulations, adult learning knowledge, really great. Really have identified a lot of um, wonderful qualities that you'll definitely need while working with Afghans. So thank you for those answers. And with that, I'm actually gonna, and we're gonna unpack some more things that hopefully you can put in your toolbox to serve these clients. But with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ella, who's gonna speak to changes in cultural orientation specific to the Afghan Placement and Assistance Program or APA. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jamie, uh, for, that, for that overview. Again, just wanna uh, encourage folks, if you have any questions, to go ahead and use that Q&A feature. And we are gonna do our best to answer the questions uh, throughout the webinar and at the end today. Um, so please uh, continue to go ahead um, and, and share your, any questions that you have. Uh, as Jamie noted, I'm going to discuss with you uh, how CO will be different for Afghan arrivals that are gonna be served under the Afghan Placement and Assistance Program or APA. I'm also going to touch a little bit on um, techniques you can use to structure your CO program um, to reach all the populations uh, that you are currently serving. Now, first that I want to provide a definition of the Afghan Placement and Assistance Program. Uh, the purpose of the APA program is to provide certain Afghans granted with parole initial relocation services for 30 to 90 days after arrival. Uh, these services will be provided by local resettlement agencies, and they'll provide direct assistant needs such as housing and basic necessities, including food, clothing, and furnishings during the first 30 to 90 days. Uh, we've gone ahead and shared for you in the chat a link to additional information about the APA program. You can also scan the QR uh, code that's on your screen if you would like additional information. Now, as previously noted, the APA program is constantly evolving to meet the needs of Afghan arrivals. And the staff here at CORE, we're not experts on the APA program. So we do encourage you, if you have specific questions on requirements, services, or concerns, that you work with your national resettlement agency. Now, I would like to do a quick knowledge check to see what you already know about the key services of the APA program. So we're gonna go ahead and launch a poll. So Manar is going to pull that up on the screen for us. And the question that we have for you are, what are some of the key services of the APA program? And your answer choices are cultural orientation, housing, access to immigration assistance, and referral to medical services. Please go ahead and select all the services that apply. And if you can't answer the poll, you can do so via the chat feature. We're still getting quite a few responses. About 60% of you have answered the question. So we'll go ahead and leave that open for another 15 seconds or so. All right, we're gonna go ahead and close that poll and we're gonna go ahead and share the results. Thank you so much, Minar. So as you can see, we got a variety of different responses. Um, you all selected all four. Some of you are saying all of them. Um, so let's go ahead and unpack these answers. First and most importantly, cultural orientation is a requirement of the APA program. Uh, we're gonna be talking a lot more about that today, uh, along with housing and access to immigration services. Referral to medical services was a bit of a trick answer. And this was done so that we could talk about it as a group. The reason this is a trick answer is because local resettlement agencies will refer clients to additional services like medical, social, and English language as they are eligible uh, where, versus all clients um, being referred. So that will be an as eligible service. 
The reason this is, is because benefits are varying state by state and the program is constantly changing. As Jamie noted, uh, just last week, uh, there was new guidance on the APA program, and then just today, there was new guidance on walk-ins. So this really brings us to uh, a very important point about delivering CO to Afghan arrivals. So I'd like us to take a moment and think about snow. And on the screen, we have this beautiful image of snow, its whiteness and its beauty and how it can look perfect understormed undisturbed and uniform. While snow can look the same, I want you to reflect for a moment on snowflakes. When we look at an individual snowflake, are they all the same? So I want you guys to go ahead and um, reflect at, on an individual snowflake um, and go ahead and share in the chat box if you think all snowflakes are the same. Great, I'm seeing a lot of chats coming in to the chat box and most of you are saying the, the answer is no. And, and this is correct. Um, so if we look at the next slide, you'll see that um, snow, those two snowflakes are the same. Um, each snowflake is unique. And when we are serving clients, they are much like snowflakes. Uh, with Afghan arrivals, it's important to remember this point and to not assume all Afghan arrivals are SIV holders or that they have limited English proficiency. Instead, there'll be a lot of variety just like you were serving any other population. So how does this affect cultural orientation delivery? Let's think about this with another poll question. So we've gone ahead and launched another poll on the screen and the answer or the question is, what are some techniques we can use to deliver cultural orientation to diverse clients? Go ahead and select all the answers that you think apply. Your answer choices are, provide everyone with the same CO sessions, identify what CO messages are best for the group, use a whole office approach to CO delivery and customize CO delivery for certain topics. Again, if you're unable to answer this poll on the screen, you can go ahead and use the chat feature to answer. We're still getting quite a few responses from you all. So we'll go ahead and leave that poll open for another 20 seconds or so. Again, if you're having any issues, you can answer in the chat box. Uh, thank you for your question, um, Katia, I think, or Katie. Uh, the whole office approach we will discuss here in just a little bit. It looks like most of you have stopped answering the poll, so we're going to go ahead and close that poll and share our results. Um, so as you can see, the highest uh, answer choice from you all is D, customized CO delivery for certain CO topics followed by B, identify what CO messages are best for the group, and then C, use a whole office approach. And then lastly, um, very few of you selected A. So the correct answers are actually B, C, and D. Uh, and so we're gonna go ahead and unpack this a little bit more. Um, so first, the reason that we don't wanna provide the same CO messages to, to everyone um, for all our CO sessions is because we have clients enrolled in different programs so if you give the same CO sessions to everyone, then you're not taking a student-centered approach. So all the techniques that we just, uh, that were correct answers are focused at putting clients at the center of their learning and building CO programs that focus on their needs. By making CO programming student-centered, we can reduce client confusion, improve client retention and streamline CO delivery for clients and resettlement staff. If you are interested in learning more about student-centered CO delivery, we encourage you to explore our provider onboarding page and additional resources. Now, before you begin delivering CO to clients in the APA program, it's best to assess the key CO messages required for each CO topic and identify which ones in the APA program are the same as other programs and which ones are different. 
Once you have done this, you'll be able to determine the appropriate mode of delivery for each CO topic and their key messages, customizing topics as appropriate for your local context and client needs. You'll be able to determine which CO topics are best delivered in a group setting with all clients enrolled in multiple programs, in a group setting with APA clients only, or in a one-on-one -on -one customized setting. As you identify the appropriate mode of delivery, you'll also begin to identify staff roles, responsibilities, and expectations, as well as who is best equipped to deliver and reinforce certain key CO messages. For example, it, might, it may be best for employment specialists to deliver CO one-on-one -on -one regarding employment paperwork instead of addressing this topic and its key messages in a group setting where employment paperwork will vary across clients enrolled in different programs and even clients in the APA program. It's, it is unrealistic in these times for a CO provider to be the sole individual responsible for delivering all key CO messages for all clients and programs without the support of resettlement staff and community partners. Now, once you've identified the key messages for, AP, for the APA program, it's important to share these key messages with all resettlement staff, volunteers, co-sponsors, interns, and community members. As Jamie has already noted, it is critical in this unprecedented time to ensure you partner appropriately with your local community. By sharing key CO messages with all community partners and resettlement staff, you'll ensure clients receive the same consistent messaging about their, their resettlement process, reducing misinformation. CORE calls this approach to CO delivery the whole office approach. By incorporating just one or all three of these techniques we've discussed, you ensure CO is structured in an efficient manner that emphasizes and places the client at the center of CO programming, while also streamlining CO delivery for your agency and staff. Now, before I turn it over to my colleague, Manar, I do want to take one more poll about cultural orientation for Afghans receiving APA. Before we launch it, I do want to emphasize that here at CORE, uh, before we launch it, CORE would like to emphasize that the CO topics chosen for the APA program were decided and defined by the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration, or PRM. So the poll question has been launched on your screen, and the question is, which CO topic is a new topic under the APA program? There's only, uh, you can only select one answer and go ahead and take about 30 seconds to complete this poll. And if you can't, you can go ahead and use the chat box. We're still receiving a few more answers, so we'll go ahead and leave that poll up for another uh, few seconds or so. Okay. We'll go ahead and close that poll and share the results. <clears throat> so the correct answer, which the majority of you did guess or get correctly, is parole status. Uh, that is a new topic under the APA program um, that is not required under the reception and placement program. So I do want to just briefly share um, a comparison of the required CO topics for the APA program and the reception and placement program. Um, as you see here, there are similarities and differences in cultural orientation programming for these two programs. And as previously noted, this really does help you structure your cultural orientation. As we've already noted, parole is a new topic for the APA program. Additionally, we do want to highlight that transportation, health, and public assistance, which are topics under the RMP program, are part of case management for the APA program instead of covered as a cultural orientation topic. However, this doesn't mean you cannot create key CO messages on these topics that are similar for APA clients in your state or location. I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Manar, who's going to provide additional tips and resources on uh, providing cultural orientation to Afghan arrivals. Thank you very much, Ella, for explaining the APA program to us. To recap, uh, CO for APA clients requires covering the 12 topics identified by PRM that you can now see on the screen. And in this section, we will focus on which topics might require more attention from CO providers and tips on teaching certain topics. So first, 
let us identify which of these topics requires more customized or one-on-one -on -one CO. And you will see a question in front of, uh, on the screen. So please type in the chat which topic or topics you think might require customized or one-on-one -on -one CO. I see hygiene, safety, your new community, parole, hygiene again, parole status, budgeting, personal finance. Great, thank you all for sharing. It is true, uh, explaining parole status requires one-on-one -on -one CO due to its, to its unique benefits and eligibility. And similarly, the budgeting and personal finance lesson should be taught one-on-one -on -one due to the different financial and employment services those on an MPA status uh, are eligible for, which will vary by case and state. You may still want actually to provide general information on these topics and CORE has identified key messages for parole status that we will share with you soon. Now, which topics do you think might require more attention. And please type in the chat. I see education, US laws, cultural adjustment, parole status again. US laws, employment safety. Employment again, cultural adjustment. Great, thank you so much for being uh, engaged and uh, sharing in the chat. Actually, based on, her, on information we currently have about this population, we have identified that cultural adjustment, US laws, law enforcement, role of the RA and employment will be very critical and although, as noted in your responses, all these topics are important. So what do we do with this information? We have um, a new, new status uh, that, that we need to uh, focus on during cultural orientation. So we identify general tips on how to approach these topics. And the first one is to apply a sensitivity lens, especially when talking about cultural adjustment and US laws. For, and that's because for newly arrived immigrants and refugees, cultural adjustment can take some time, especially if it is accompanied by resettlement trauma and stress, uh, which affects family dynamics as a result. This is not to assume that everyone who will respond negatively to resettlement stress. And therefore, CEO providers should have a nuanced approach to discussing topics like family dynamics and domestic violence with clients. And again, we don't wanna assume anything about our clients, uh, like Ella mentioned earlier in her beautiful snowflake uh, uh, image. Uh, we, do not, do not, we do not want to assume that these changes might lead to domestic violence or negative family dynamics. And, in order to avoid these assumptions, one tip could be to hold separate CEO sessions for men and women to allow space for clients, specifically women, to learn more about their rights and feel safe to share freely. Our next tip is to reiterate same topics at multiple points during CL. Like Jamie mentioned earlier, cognitive overload and competing priorities in addition to stress can affect someone's ability to retain information. Therefore, it is important to plug in information at multiple points during CO. For instance, in going back to the uh, family dynamics topic, the same idea about changes in family dynamics due to stress can be reiter reiterated under rights and responsibility, responsibilities, specifically when talking about the First Amendment rights and the principles of equality for everyone regardless of gender and age. And that also includes uh, engaging or um, communicating with law enforcement at, at the same time. The third tip that we have for you is create trust with your client. What does that mean? 
So like Jamie mentioned earlier, uh, there is a lot of misinformation and um, a lot of the clients might have friends who have been resettled before, uh, not knowing that they have been resettled under different statuses. They might, they might uh, offer information, help, thinking that they're being helpful. But what we really want to do is to create uh, this type of uh, relationship and rapport with our clients so that they can come to you for questions instead of reaching to their friends and family. Uh, this is not like we mentioned, or, uh, well, like I just mentioned, this is not a new issue. Um, and like, for instance, as for the role of the resettlement agency, the APA status will require a tailored lesson because eligibility will, like we said, will vary based on case and state. And in this regard, it is very important to battle misinformation regarding benefits by stressing that benefits will vary by state and status um, and that building trust can start and like for to build stress, sorry, to build trust, uh, it starts by active listening to your clients, actively listening, being honest about and clear about what you can and can't do for them, sharing resources that can be language specific when possible so that they can have the agency in information access. And the last point that we have is for certain topics like employment, for instance, provide general information. Um, in employment, you can discuss the general rights and responsibilities for employment. You can do employment and orientation, but it is better to refer the client to the employment team to discuss more status specific employment opportunities for them. In addition to these tips, we identified certain resources at CORE, at from CORE that you can access uh, to help you deliver cultural orientation for your clients. And uh, one of them is activity, they are activity banks. As you can see in front of you under the, acti the under activity banks, we have activity banks for multiple topics. And if we go to cultural adjustment, you can see that there are general tips on how to teach this topic and multiple activities that can be tailored regarding on how you deliver cultural orientation in person virtually in a group setting or what else. Um, um, there are uh, also, you know, uh, you will have exactly uh, materials that you will need in order to teach this activity. The other resource that we have for you is the resettlement, uh, the core nav or resettlement navigator. As you can see, it will be, it is in multiple languages. And if you click on one of them, you want to go to cultural orientation for refugees. And this is mainly a resource for refugees that they can access. For instance, if you go to employment, you will find multiple media in which clients can uh, use uh, and access information. So please feel free to share these resources with your client. And the last resource that we have for you is our newly uh, launched uh, Facebook page for Settle In, and this page is specifically for Afghan uh, clients or Afghans in general to learn about the uh, resettlement in the U.S. As you can see, posts are in English, Pashto, and Dari, and uh, they are be the the posts are uh, being posted and edited by our community, uh, digital, digital community liaisons who answer questions that uh, people uh, ask uh, within 24 to 48 business hours. So please feel free to use these resources and share with your clients. One uh, thing I wanted to mention about the core nav is that you uh, might may have noticed that there aren't there aren't Dari um, resources, but we are at core working on developing and translating some a limited number of resources into Dari. And now we are going to turn it. Uh, over to Jamie for Q&A. Great, thanks. And just a uh, clarification, we have Dari, 
uh, in Settlin and on Cornav, but we don't have Pashto currently. Um, so that is uh, what we're prioritizing in Pashto is the videos. Uh, and so those will um, hopefully soon, 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 those will be ready. Um, and so we will, um, the best way to know about when things are ready from us is to sign up for our newsletter. So we'll give that link to you actually right here. Uh, you'll see there's um, a QR code. Um, I think we're also going to pop that link into the chat. So if you're not registered for our newsletter, that's the best way to be updated about when new resources are coming are becoming available. So uh, I wanted to we have we're great on time. So we've left plenty of time for Q&A. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that open and go through some of the questions. So one of the first questions is uh, from Jenny. She says, it's my understanding that we don't yet know what services they will receive because they might fall under different visas and thus receive different benefits. Is this correct? Okay, so let's unpack this question. So what um, I think the, the better terminology for us to use in this context is to say different status, right? So there are multiple status uh, statuses that are that we have when uh, we talk about um, newcomers to the United States. Uh, traditionally, we have refugees, we have special immigrant visa holders, um, and now uh, another category is humanitarian parolees. And I think that was another question on here was, are Afghan evacuees still being classified as humanitarian parolees or do they now have refugee status? They are being classified as humanitarian parolees. So when we think about another status, think about as asylum. So we think about these different statuses. Refugee status is only uh, pro is provided when someone is overseas and then brought to the United States as a third country. Okay, this is why Afghans who are in the United States, they came directly from Afghanistan to the United States. They are being paroled into the country. Okay, so there's that distinction. Now, the second part of the the other part of this question is they receive different benefits. So historically speaking, yes, um, refugees uh, receive uh, certain benefits through the reception and placement program. They're also eligible um, for some of the uh, Office of Refugee Resettlement ORR funding, matching grant, um, preferred communities. Those programs are also, avail uh, also available to other eligible populations based on the stipulations of those grants. I'm not an expert on all of them, but there is those different stipulations. So to, um, uh, sorry, I lost the question. I wanna make sure I have all the, the answers to it. So yes, so the benefits, um, yes, are have typically been different. However, what happened, uh, what has been happening since the Afghans arrived is first that PRM, the State Department, announced a new uh, notice of funding opportunity called the Afghan Placement and Assistance Program, APA. And what that did is that created a mechanism by which Afghans that were paroled into the country could be eligible for services for the first 30 to 90 days. Um, and those services are outlined in the cooperative agreement. Those services largely mirror the same services that refugees would receive in the reception and placement program. But there are differences. And as Ella said, um, your national resettlement agency um, headquarters should be cascading that information in terms of those dis differences. So I think, of, uh, for example, one difference in our, you know, RNP, there's a 24 hour home, home visit, but in APA, I believe the time frame is 48 hours. So there's small differences with that. What we focused on today was the cultural orientation differences in terms of what should be covered and what shouldn't be covered. Um, the other part of this question, um, you know, I'm actually answering multiple questions because Charlie also asked, are they eligible for ORR funded uh, funding? You know, how has this changed? So in addition to APA, what happened last week is that um, Congress passed a continuing resolution which um, allowed for uh, additional services that are funneled through the Office of Refugee and uh, Office of Refugee Resettlement ORR. Um, and the other thing is there's also been an additional um, uh, passing of that uh, originally that parolees couldn't get certain um, eligible like, services for medical um, and now they can. So as we mentioned, this is very fluid. So, you know, 
three weeks ago, the answer to this question would be like, yeah, they're, they're different. But as we move along, the services are being put into place. But again, this is why it's really critical that you're keeping an eye and talking to your leadership at your organizations and understand what those differences are as they evolve. Um, another example is previously walk-ins um, from the bases we're not eligible for services, but that guidance has shifted. Um, so it's really, again, just critical that you talk to your leadership and make sure you have that information as it is available. So I'm gonna say that Jenny, hopefully that answered your question. Um, the, let me see what else we also, um, also answered a Sadia's question about the status and I thought it was a Friday, Rachel, yes, thank you, the eligible for pu public assistance. Um, so that one was also answered. And let's go back to the top question. So I see we have, what is the expected length of processing time for evacuees in military bases? So we don't have a specific timeline that's really gonna vary on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and there's a variety of factors that might influence that. Um, so, there is a lot of different activities happening at the bases, both medical processing, um, case processing, um, and also uh, applying for um, completing the I-795, our form I-795 for employment authorization. Um, so I cannot give you an answer on the length of processing time. I do note that, you know, we launched Settle in Facebook, which is a, a has a direct messaging feature. Um, so we are getting a lot of questions, particularly from family members wanting to know what, what can I do? Um, you know, can my family member leave? And I would definitely recommend going to the Settle in Facebook page or referring to them that to that them to that. Um, and then I will also include some other um, links in the chat here shortly. Um, I can't multitask and answer questions, but there's some other documents that you might be able to um, provide. Uh, all right. The next question that has been upvoted is, does APA client require to receive cultural orientation and post-test as RMP clients? Oh, this is a great question. Um, so my answer is that I have to check, but I would presume um, that I'd have to check the co cooperative agreement, but the RMP test is for RMP clients. Um, and so this is something we're gonna have to follow up on. So really great question. Thanks for uh, flagging it. I'm sorry, I can't give you the answer. I don't wanna say yes or no, and then uh, we have to check with PRM to see what that requirement is, but great, great question. So we'll follow up on that one in particular. Okay, um, Charlie is asked to what extent is the key information for cultural orientation subject to change based on the recent announcement that APA arrivals will be eligible for ORR funded services from resettlement agencies. Yeah, so, you know, cultural orientation is a part of the early resettlement process in the first 90 days. Um, and ORR funding, depending on the program, can happen during that time, but it might be um, other programs that are later in that process. Um, so to Ella's point, when we go back and we kind of look at the different topics of what's required as a part of cultural orientation for APA, let me just get that, that single list that we have here. Actually, we can do, we'll do the comparison one. So you'll see on here, public assistance is normally required as a part of reception and placement. And that's where you can kind of go into like the benefits and what's, but under APA, it's not required. Um, so that doesn't mean you shouldn't be covering public assistance. That just mean, in, that just means that it's not happening in cultural orientation. Those benefits are gonna be covered through case management. And that actually is quite, uh, I, I can see why that's quite smart in the sense of because it's changing and every case is so different, we wanna make sure that we're not giving blanket statements that everybody's eligible for the same public assistance. Um, now, that being said, you could, if you had the capacity, talk generally about what public assistance is available, but that might get you more questions than answers if you're doing that in a group setting. All right, let's see. Um, and I know the chat has been quite active, um, so I will toggle to that in a second. Um, what is the timeline for service to begin when evacuees spend a period of time? Okay, Jason has asked, what is the timeline for service to begin when evacuees spend a period of time in the base? So the time for services does not start until they have um, left the bases. So if they're at the bases, let's say for a month, that doesn't mean they've lost 30 days of service eligibility. That doesn't start until they've left the bases. So hopefully that um, answers that question. Um, so Walid asks, is 30 to 90 days enough to help Afghan people resettle here? Great question. So 
Keep in mind that under reception and placement, which is the historical program that all refugees have um, come through uh, through the United States Refugee Admissions Program, has the same language. It's the first 30 to 90 days. However, we know, as I mentioned, that there are other programs that individuals might be eligible for that go beyond 90 days based on the case. Um, and so I think there is an acknowledgement that in reality, when we talk about being resettled, no, you're not going to be fully resettled in your first 90 days, and you're not going to be totally culturally oriented to your new community. Um, however, there are now other programs that individuals may be eligible for. Um, so the 30 to 90 days is more to guide the programming and the services and what services are critical that meet basic needs. Um, but every resettlement agency might look at um, how they can provide additional support based on their capacity and resources available. All right, you guys are asking some great questions. Um, I um, don't know, Ella and Menar, if I need to take a look at the chat, if there's anything. Kate, thank you for, um, let me actually just do that. Let me pivot over to the chat real quick. So, because um, I see we have some answers coming in as well. Um, we talked about 30 to 90 days. I would like to read email paperwork to receive regarding what to expect when they enter. Yes. Yeah, so uh, let me actually share um, one website that I think will be helpful for that particular question. So um, here is the, this is the Refugee Processing um, Center. So this is where um, you can find the directory of APA affiliates. And then here's also um, from, uh, this was developed by the State Department, um, things you need to know about resettling in the United States. Um, I also do know that the national resettlement agencies were also provide, provided with language about what letter people are receiving prior to the departure. Um, and so those are resources that your national resettlement agency should have access to. Um, I know there's a lot of different places where those are also posted, so we'll be sure to, um, if we are able to find them on the web, include those um, as a part of the follow-up resources. Okay. Um, I see a question uh, yeah, Jenny, from thanks. Laura. Um, it says, you mentioned providing cultural orientation and basis. Our state refugee coordinator was contacted by Fort Lee for assistance with CO. Is CORE planning to offer orientation or would this be something the local resettlement agencies may help with? Uh, sorry, the question so, is, yeah. Laurel, feel free. I, I don't yes. want to take your voice away from you. Feel free. Is this in the yeah. chat or is it in the q and It's in the chat. Okay. Sorry. Yes. One second. I just, um, I'm obviously not as strong of an auditory learner. <laughs> so let me just read the question here. Um, okay. Let's see. And again, if you could please use the Q&A, that will be helpful. Okay. Providing cultural orientation. Our state refugee coordinator was contacted before leave for assistance with CEOs. Core plan to offer orientations or would this be something? Okay. So um, the at the basis, we are coordinating with DHS, PRM, USCCB and um, to uh, coordinate what cultural orientation is happening at the basis. So we are working on trying to disseminate key messaging, making sure that they're using the resources, but there's a lot of competing priorities at the basis, a lot of immediate needs, um, basic needs that are trying to be met. Um, so it is possible that some people are being deployed and maybe assisting with that, um, but that's all being coordinated within the bases. I think one way to think about the bases is to think of them as resettlement support centers, right? When when individuals are processed overseas, they go through a whole system and work with staff, and then they also get pre-departure cultural orientation. It's sort of what you have here is all the processing happening, but these are pop-ups. They just pop, you know, they just, you know, we're only maybe a month in, month and a half. I, I know Fort Lee was started a little bit sooner. Um, and so there's a lot of things that they're putting in place. And so it is an evolving situation. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, Okay. There is a really excellent question for us in the chat. Um, would you have good suggestions on advice we could give Afghans when we're telling them about CORNAV? For example, should we say CORNAV is a great resource, but keep in mind some of the resources and key messages are specifically for refugees in the RMP program? Or are there specific resources we should use? Yeah, great question. So at this stage, because of the um, the, the Yes, let me let me just go to Cordav as a, the best way to answer, I think, this question. So let me go here. OK, so Cornav, all the topics. I, pardon me, I'm going to go into English because I'm I um, it's easier for me to navigate. Um, so if we go to the start of Cornav, OK, so 
anything that's under the United States Refugee Emissions Program is not going to be applicable to Afghans um, who've arrived here because this is all about the processing part of resettlement. When you go under the cultural orientation section, these topics will be applicable because they've been, uh, the majority of them have been written to include that language as, as eligible and they've been written for a, a kind of national audience. Um, I would carefully kind of check them to double, you know, if you, you know, if you want to, um, but the, the topics we actually highlighted in preparation for this, there are specific topics that we think would be even, would be the best ones to provide. Um, so under education, for example, this talks about the education system, supporting your child in school, digital awareness, that's, that's relevant to anybody who's a newcomer. Okay. When we go to, um, the learning English, same thing, it's relevant. So to answer the simple answer is yes, you can still provide it to them in terms of the best way to message and send them. Um, we have created, uh, in the, we have created, um, palm cards and flyers that give them instructions on how to use them. If you're nervous about someone's ability to navigate these systems, I think Settle in Facebook is gonna be your best bet because all of the messaging is being specifically customized to the present circumstances with Afghan arrivals. So this is a good starting point. Um, if you're worried about, okay, can they navigate an app? this is a good place because we're customizing and catering and making sure we're answering those questions. All right. Thank you, Jackie. Answered the question about the assessment is not required, but is a best practice. So Jackie is one of the national resettlement agencies, USCCB. So just to follow up on that, the, the assessment is not required, but it is a best practice. So that is an answer to APACO. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Let me go to, we just have a few more minutes left and we still have a lot of questions. Um, I think I'm going to take one more question and then we're going to wrap up and um, talk about next steps. So Dina asked, is there an update on core on parole status? So um, I believe Ella Menar mentioned this. So we have developed key messages and objectives for parole status, and we're working on creating activities for those, and those should be ready in the coming weeks. Um, so we appreciate your patience, but we are coming up with some general kind of uh, messages that you can provide to parolees about their status and what that means. I see there is quite a lot of, there are a number of questions here around, you know, the documents they receive, um, you know, how do they apply for asylum, those sorts of things. So again, um, refer you to your national resettlement agencies to also get those questions. Kate also provided the ORR um, PDF, which I can share on the screen as well. This is talking about benefits for parolees um, and sort of provides that information. They are working on translating this in Dari and Pashto. Um, all right, so with that, um, this hour went by super fast. I apologize, we didn't get to answer all of your questions, but hopefully we've answered uh, quite a number of them, and we're going to continue to kind of look at these questions um, and see um, if there's any that we were not able to answer that we answer in the follow up. Um, what I'd like to do is close out by well, um, inviting you to complete our post webinar survey. Um, so this survey uh, helps us uh, have information about how we did, how we how we answered your questions, did we meet our objectives, but Another key thing on there is that we're actually asking for your feedback on what other additional assistance you need when it comes to implementing APA and working with Afghan arrivals, um, because we do want to be responsive to your needs. Um, so please, um, in the chat, you'll see that Ella has posted the um, the survey. Um, so go ahead and click on that. We've given you a couple minutes just to fill it out before we close out. And then we also have the QR code on the screen. So with that, I'm going to put myself on mute, give you guys a couple minutes to complete that survey. And thank you again for your wonderful engagement, your wonderful questions. Um, I really appreciate everybody's um, interest and attention on this subject. And a big thank you to Manar and Ella for um, co-facilitating with me today.